Welcome to the WT FFF Special Series, brought to you by the Z and 3D print teams from HP, where your hosts, Tom and Tracy Hazard, explore the all about the what of 3D workflows from concept to print. Welcome back to WTFFF in this special series sponsored by HP. I'm Tom Hazard, along with my co-host Tracy Hazard. And today we're going to talk about 3D manufacturing cost. Well, you know, we're, we're really going to talk about opportunities, like opportunity costs, because sometimes we have to look at things from a different perspective. We have to look at them from the perspective of what am I going to gain by taking advantage or researching or evaluating this opportunity, but what am I potentially going to lose? If I get disrupted, and in today's world, I think the big question is, is it's not if you get disruptive, it's how soon you're going to get disruptive, because that's what's really happened to most industries, most businesses, retailers. Just look at it everywhere around us right now. The disruption we all knew was coming, for instance, in mass market retail, we were seeing store traffic decline. We're seeing retail mm -hmm. decline, and all of a sudden, wow, there's nothing, right? It went it dried up overnight. Now- how do you flex? How do you take advantage of those opportunities? And how does that not become a complete loss for your business? Because you didn't take it seriously and you said that will happen someday. You know, uh, we've experienced a lot of different businesses and industries, large businesses in large industries in the United States over the several decades of our careers and seen what happened to companies that were in denial about you know, how things were changing in their industry. Pretty much every industry, there are early adopters, there are people that embrace change, see the opportunities there are to gain by, you know, shifting and changing the way they do things. And then others that really become dinosaurs, they resist change, they don't want to, you know, accept the reality that they've got to adapt or they are going to be disrupted. And it's really unfortunate. And I think the 3D printing industry is no exception to that. Right. And for those out there who said, oh, this 3D printing thing, it's a fad. It's not going to happen. There's no tipping point. Like it's not going to come. And yet now here we are in a place where 3D printing is a logical solution to get our PPE printed, to get all of these things accomplished. And so we want to look at that and say to ourselves, whenever these things come on and we hear disruption in the word, instead of tuning out, we start to say, what if they're right? and we lose everything and our business shifts and change underneath us, what do we wish, what will we wish we knew, right? How can we look at it from that perspective? And that means what today should we start researching in? What should we leveraging? What should we start looking into? What should we start listening for? And you know, a couple of the things that HP has given us, which I'm really grateful for because they're really interesting case studies. So they've given us two case studies, which are downloadable for this episode. So when you go to the blog post for this episode at 3dstartpoint.com, you'll be able to find them. One is about how Smile Direct is using the HP multi gut fusion technology to scale their business model. But it's really, it's not about what machine they're using. It's about the scaling of their business model and how they're using that. And they disrupted and are disrupting uh, dental industry, right? So things are going on there. So it's really interesting to see this case study and look at what a disruption model might look like. Another one that they've given us is about customized eyewear. So now we're talking about personalizing and customizing, not a full disruption of an industry, but creating a segment within one, an opportunity carved out for a need that's not being met because so much eyewear is actually very mass produced as we've learned through our own eyewear exploration that there are very few companies that control that. So, you know, looking at that, I think these are some of the ideas that we want to plant in your mind by looking at, we don't just want to look at what's the cost of bringing 3D manufacturing into our facility. You know, what's the cost of 3D manufacturing? We're going to look at it, what is the opportunity for utilizing it and what's the potential loss if, it, if things are disrupted. And I wish I knew about it and I wish I had access to it. Well, I think those are two great examples, Tracy. And, uh, you know, it's the real thing for, for every business to consider is at what point do you, well, I think you need to be considering it today. You absolutely do. But at what point do you invest and do you maybe experiment in, you know, new technologies and, and how you can be disruptive instead of being disrupted? 
Yeah. And you know, a lot of times we, we set our metrics in such a way that we're looking at like the part cost of something, right? But what about the supply chain disruption cost of something? Like, do we need to have access to that? Do we need to build cord capability on it? Do we need to get a deeper understanding? Do we need to buy a printer today so that we have some in, in-house understanding of how things can work so that tomorrow we can see how we could flexibly shift, how we could buy a whole fleet of them if necessary, whatever it is, so that we can take advantage of the learnings that we created to understand what it might be like tomorrow. A lot of times the cost-effective bottom line balance isn't there today, but we're planning for the future. We're not planning for yesterday. We're not, you know, we're not always taking something that worked before and the basically saying, okay, how can we be more profitable with it today? That's, you know, that's a different model. That's a value add engineering, right? That's, you know, you're VAing. And you want, we want to look at it from a different perspective. We're looking at that future cost of things. So the future cost of doing business, the future cost of loss of business. And how can we be rep prepared for that today? And now sometimes we just need to use a service bureau. We don't need to be doing it ourselves. So we can use 3D as a service um, or products, you know, being having products outsourced until it becomes realistic for us to do things in-house. So there's a whole host of ways to get around the cost of 3D printers today or the cost of what you want to build in to start 3D manufacturing today. There's a whole way around that, but it starts with exploration and thinking. Absolutely. Exploration, thinking, discovery. And I, I think that oftentimes when, you know, looking at the opportunity cost, one thing that is all too often overlooked is time savings and labor savings that you, people are just looking at capital expenditures, getting a machine in and, you know, using it and experimenting. And certainly there are investment costs, but the opportunity is speed to market. And that's a lot of times some of the, when you're being disrupted, you know, you're going to find yourself so much further behind the competition that no amount of money and time you throw at it is going to help you catch up fast enough. You're going to be me too. You're not going to be an innovator and on the front edge of this. Well, and you know what, that ties perfectly into the episode that we're, re that we're reusing here. We're repurposing and re and have re-edited into this episode for you because that's exactly where we were. We were sitting at that point of, do we invest our time and money into something that we don't know if it's going to pan out or not, or do we not? And so that's where this, this episode first aired and first addressed 3D manufacturing costs and 3D opportunity costs. All right. Well, hey, let's, I hope you enjoy this episode. Let's go to it. I think it's still very relevant today and hope you agree with us. Hi, this is Tom and Tracy on the WTFFF 3D Printing Podcast. And we're going to talk today about the opportunity cost of 3D printing. Yeah. I mean, yesterday's podcast got me thinking really about sort of the opportunity cost that we went through when we decided whether or not we were going to 3D print at all, right? We sat there and you wanted a 3D printer really badly. And I many didn't really of you care about the opportunity cost. Right. I you just care wanted about a... the financial consequences. I just wanted it. Right. So I'm going to tell the story again. For those of you who have been a longtime listener, you can sort of tune out for two minutes, but I'm going to tell the story again because we have a lot of new listeners seeing where, well, I don't even know what episode number we're on anymore. 470 something, I think. Yeah, we're in the high four. Sessions. Yeah. And so it's been a long time since perhaps we told our Genesis story of how we started 3D printing. So I'm going to quickly go over it. And so I was very, very pregnant and very, very pissed off. I was pregnant with my third daughter and I was very, very pissed off because we had a client who didn't pay us and we were very cranky because we were flying on an airplane all the way across the country for a very freezing cold Thanksgiving with our family back east. And Tom kept pulling out the Make magazine and he was all excited about the latest 3D printers and we should buy one for our business. And I was like, we just got stiff $40,000 and there was no way I was buying a $4,000 printer. Right. And so he kept up at it, kept saying, we should do it. We should do it. And it was what you sold me on was what I would call the opportunity cost. Right. Right. The fact that we believe strongly in our business and skill building and being ahead of innovation and understanding innovation and how it's applied for our clients. And if we don't try this, we're missing the opportunity. And that's how you sold me on it, because I kept pushing back on you saying, what are we going to use it for? What are we going to make with it? Our clients don't need this type of prototyping. It's not a service we are going to provide today. And so when you look at it from that, you miss the opportunity of it. Right. And the opportunity being for us, and we, we're doing this every day now, 
is that we have clients, we're developing products, and it's the old way of developing product is you, you know, of course, you draw it on paper or you draw it in CAD in the computer, and you think you understand three dimensionally what it is and how it's going to look and how it's going to feel, but until you physically have it, there's something missing and oftentimes when you finally get something in 3d let's say you had a model maker build it or you sent it out or whatever you get it back and it's not what you expected and you end up making changes so we very quickly we print things here in our office and experience them like oh that really wasn't what i thought it was going to be and you have this quick iterative process that speeds us up Right. And I'm impressed with the fact that we are actively using it with clients. I certainly didn't expect us to be, but our client base diversified to smaller products, which most of them were very large at the the time in the past. So at the time at which we were evaluating it, the opportunity, we just didn't have a lot of smaller products we were doing for clients. So if they were ingredients in a bigger product, we might have used it for. So, but we are doing that because it's diversified so much for us. But I say still, we probably don't use it more than 10% of the time with our clients. So even still, and Analyzing it, you would be like, do we really need a 3D print tech in our office? And do we need a 3D printer? And like all of those things, you may still say that the cost benefit analysis would come out saying, "Mm, no, it's not. But you're disregarding again the opportunity cost of how it's changing your process, speeding things up, things that may not be completely measurable and tangible. I was going to say tangible. Yeah. And so that's really where not diving in and buying a 3D printer. That's why it kind of came to my mind again yesterday as we were talking about the cheap 3D printers is that not doing anything just because of cost seems the wrong thing when there are so many cheap 3D printer options out there. Because in buying one at that rate, you're starting And you're evaluating that opportunity for yourself and you're starting to see whether or not those intangibles are making sense for your business, for your personal growth, for your skill building, which is how you sold me on that. That was so many years ago. Well, for us, we were evaluating our business and what we're going to do going forward. And of course, once I convinced you, we saw 3D printing as a big opportunity and we didn't want to be behind the curve. Right. We wanted to be on the front side of that curve. And that doesn't mean that today... It's not worth doing if you're new to 3D printing. No, no. I think it's even more worth doing because I think there's a lot of more proof of application in various areas. There's proof of people using it in areas that have made it more tangible and are making it more competitive in terms of if you are in that marketplace and you're competing against them, they're utilizing it. It's speeding up their process. It's helping them. So I do think there's even more tangible and applied reasons to buy one today. Well, including what we're seeing is actual 3D printed end use consumer products, which I think a few years ago, a lot more people would have scoffed at the idea of that because, oh, they're just prototypes or they're just little plastic things or whatever. But you know, you have what's going on with the bespoke designs that are 3D print end use products. And then What we're actually doing with some of our clients and making 3D print and use products in short initial product runs that are sold on Amazon so they can test the design before they spend tooling dollars and make sure that, as you always say, the dogs will eat the dog food before you go and spend a whole lot of money. Right. And then you go as far up as weave wearables and feats, you know, and are making actual end product that are being, I saw a thing about feats. Feats was right here in, I think it was Long Beach or something like that. We missed them. We were out of town, we were out of town yeah. but they were in Long Beach doing a DSW, the shoe warehouse, doing a pop-up shop. Fantastic. I would have loved to have seen that. And I'm so sorry we missed that. But there you go. There's a really good example of retail integration too. So in our marketplace, had we seen that four years ago, I would have absolutely gone, yep, yeah, we're doing it. You know, there would have been no question in the opportunity cost. But, you know, I really want to talk about this because it also reminded me of a conversation I had. I guess it would have been a year ago. It would have been about a year ago. ago. Walter O'Brien. And we'll put a link to the article that I wrote from it. And it's an interesting thing. So I asked him at the very end of our conversation. Let's just remind everybody who Walter O'Brien is. Oh, yeah. (laughs) Sorry. Yeah. (laughs) If you've ever seen this TV show, Scorpion. Right. And I don't know. I'm a big fan. I like the show. I like it, too. Yeah. So Scorpion is about a kind of a elite, very smart, like high IQ, very, very high IQ individuals who are teamed up to solve problems. And a lot of them are like world saving, of course, on the show. And actually, in real life, it's based on a true story, based on a real man, Walter O'Brien, who I met. And he has a 194 IQ. It's just 
which Amazing. is just incredible. And there's a tale in there about IQ versus EQ. And that's what he talked about at this conference that I met him at and was able to interview him personally about. But I think you would not believe that the man has a low EQ. And an EQ is emotional quotient, right? So IQ is your intelligence quotient. And so when someone has a high EQ, less of their brain is working on that sort of relationship and emotion, their communication, communication right. skills, right? But it can be learned is what he's proven, that you can be trained to be more connective. And it is an actually very efficient way. High EQ people do better in the world. It's sure because relationships power a lot of what happens in the world today. So developing those skills are extremely important to high IQ people. And that's what he does within his organization for all of his people. And they have what they call super nannies which I forgot the actress's name, Catherine. I don't know whatever. the actress's name. The, the one who was an American Idol. Or was, well, no, she was on that other, no, she's an actress, but she was on that other TV show that was like an American Idol No, no, show. no, she was an American Idol. Was she herself? Yeah. Oh, okay. I, I don't know. know that she actually Shows won or she I was like a her. second placer or something like that. Catherine McPhee, that's it. And she plays the super nanny on the TV show Scorpion. Which is basically that she helps them communicate better because otherwise a lot of people would stop communicating with these people that are so in the weeds of the math and the tech and the science, right? But in their high Because it's efficient, right? right? And so how to be more efficient in getting accomplished what you want to accomplish. But back to the story of my interviewing him. So I was really nervous. That was probably the most nervous I've ever been interviewing anyone in my entire life. Even more than interviewing John Travolta? Yeah, John Travolta well, no, was totally the, different. No, yeah. no, it was different, but ahead of the interview, not having talked to him yet, you were not more nervous about John Travolta? No, no, oh, no, interesting. no. John Travolta, totally different story. <laughs> let's, not, let's, not, let's not go down there. But there's that an article there, too, so I'll link to that article. Uh, but anyway, Walter O'Brien, yeah, I was nervous because I was like, I mean, this is intimidating. Like, I think I'm a smart person. This is a really smart person. Like, how do I ask <laughs> questions that don't sound stupid, right? Like, that was very intimidating to me as I'm preparing for this, which I only had 10 minutes to prepare to talk to him too. Yeah, they didn't give you a lot of warning no, that it, you wanted you to interview No, him. when I was interviewing John Travolta, I had two days. They told me earlier the day before I was going to interview him the, the other night, so I had almost two days to prepare. But I didn't have you know a lot of time, so I had to come up with my questions off the cuff. And finally, at the very end of the whole question and answer, which it was all about design process and like how, you know, stay ahead of innovation and sort of the curve of innovation. How do you know if something's worthwhile doing? And as we were talking about it, I said to him, in your analysis of everything that you've gone through and done, what would you say is the most common problem that people have and the reason why things aren't successful? And I mentioned to him that I had done some study of reports out there in Entrepreneur Magazine, Inc. Magazine, Fortune Gosh, I'm trying to think of what other ones. So a couple of other there of those type of level, Harvard Business Review, and analyzed what they said the failure for startups were. And so whether it was money, team, market, product, like a whole bunch of things like that. And what I learned was that product market fit was the biggest problem. It's yeah, 50, more than 50%, it's right? It's 54% of the problem is yeah. product market fit. Most, more than 54% of the time. Of the, the time. Yeah, it's yeah. the problem. It's the reason why it, either you had the right product but the wrong market or you had the wrong market but the right product. And so the fit didn't match, right? So this is what I say to him. And he said, actually, I believe that it's Timing. Timing timing and it has to do with opportunity costs for most people they take too long to get to market because they don't tangibly analyze the opportunity costs they miss the proper calculations interesting because the things that we sometimes see as intangible are actually measurable in terms of like they would be able to figure out how to measure them right, right. we think of them as somewhat intangible but there's a cost of not doing something that may make you fail at a higher rate than anything else and he said the other flip side of that is people jumping in too soon. So they're too soon for it. So had we dove in four years ago and went whole hog into a 3D print business, we might have been successful, but likely for the market that we wanted to be in was too soon. Would have been too soon. And we knew that. Right. We tested we it. That. We anticipated yeah, we it would be a risk. And we were testing out product market fit because that's what I know how to do. That's what we do in our business every day. It's why we have a better hit ratio than anyone else in the design area for consumer products. It's because we're always testing out whether or not it's a fit for the market that we're going after. And when we see that it's not, we have time to make adjustments to make it fit. And or we have time to kill it and do something new because of what we right. learned, right? So, well, we, we fail fast. If we, we fail, fail fast, yeah. right? So we have removed a lot of that opportunity cost analysis problem 
from the market fit standpoint, but it doesn't mean that we aren't sitting behind too long. His voice has been in my head a lot in the last couple of months. It's that we are going to miss our opportunity in 3D printing retail if we don't do if something. We don't jump soon. into the big plan that we because want to it's do. timed yeah. now. Mm. Like that are enough success indicators that we should be doing something. And so it's in my head that that opportunity cost, that that timing requires a leap of faith sometimes. Well, I'm sure it requires a leap of faith. I mean, because nobody has a complete crystal ball to be able to tell. But, you know, as creative people, we do have a vision and we always are creating new things. And so you and I are less risk averse than a lot of business people who might be more conservative where they want to know, hey, there's an absolute market for that out there. You can know that the dogs eat the dog food. You may have to take a leap. So it's, it makes it tough. There's an opportunity cost to doing it too soon, and there's an opportunity cost to waiting too long. Right, exactly. Right. Yeah, a negative cost, right? Yeah. <laughs> it costs you your opportunity. I just wrote an article within the last week for Inc., for my column there, and it was really about the fact that the job right now, in demand already, are designers. We've known that this was coming in this area. We had a little bit of insight from a client CEO of his company. Unfortunately, he passed away. Such a shame because he was a really, really good man, an incredibly smart business person, very successful. He was at this high level corporate meeting in New York where a bunch of marketing companies were brought in to say what the future of their businesses was going to be. You know, it's, it's one of these high level. I guess, conferences or something and special speakers who really were providing some insight into the future. And the companies attending were all more traditional manufacturing companies. And what they were told is, all you traditional manufacturing companies are going to have to reinvent yourselves because in the coming years, and at that time, they were saying that it was 15 years in the future. But I remember when you and I spoke with Ken and this this gentleman's name is Ken, he actually speculated that it wasn't even going to be 15 years off. Right. That so many more actual consumer products are going to be on demand 3D printed locally that a lot of companies are invested heavily in manufacturing equipment or factories in Asia or their business model is built around importing products. There's going to be a major shift. Now, there will always be some products that will still be imported like that. I mean, one example that we know a lot about is furniture. And if you're going to build physical furniture, especially out of materials like wood and things, you're going to have a high labor cost of manufacture. And that's probably still going to be done somewhere overseas and imported for the most part. And there's always exceptions, but for the most part. But for smaller consumer products and certain materials that certain consumer products are made of, there's going to be a lot more of that done in the U.S. and locally all around the world. There's going to be a bigger shift to local manufacturing. But- and there is already a bigger shift of what we call last mile delivery. In other words, you see that there's Amazon warehouses popping up everywhere. Walmart's doing the same thing. You're within so many miles of these stores in which they have the ability to deliver from there. So that they've distributed their warehousing, localized their warehousing, right? I agree. And so distribution of retail is changing right before our eyes right now, but manufacturing of it is changing. But what the big point of this, which matches what you were saying, Tracy, is that what Ken told us from this conference is these marketing groups are saying there's going to be a huge demand in the future for designers and engineers because you're going to have this really huge increase in local manufacturing, you're lowering the barrier to entry for smaller companies on smaller budgets who are going to be able to produce their own products because the cost of doing that with on-demand 3D printing is less and you don't have to tool as much. So engineers and designers are going to be the growth jobs and in high demand. And I'm happy about that because then designers will really get paid more what well, they deserve. I yeah, think. because when there's high demand and low supply, which there is at Costs this point, will right, up, uh, right. prices will go up and the, and pay will go up, which is desperately needed right now because it's not cost effective. It, right. It's not. It's and, not effective to be a designer when in a Fiverr world. I just really wanted everyone to be thinking about that opportunity cost. So whether it's a student opportunity cost for your career in the future, it's your opportunity cost of having one in your household, so you're exposing your family, it's your job as a teacher to be exposing it and presenting the opportunities of the future to your students, it's a business, and you've got to analyze the opportunity cost of being on the edge of innovation on the wave of innovation at this point, because it's not an edge anymore. That's what we're seeing very clearly. So, you know, thinking about all those things and thinking about not missing that opportunity cost, we're way past it being experimental. 
I think you have to think about can you afford the opportunity cost or can you not afford the opportunity lost? That's right. So anyway, that's what we've been thinking about. We thought we'd present our thoughts to you and share that with you. And all our article links and everything we talked about in this episode will be on 3dstartpoint.com on the blog post for this episode. And we will also have uh, posts on 3D Start Point Facebook page and other places on social media. Thanks for listening, everybody. We'll be back tomorrow with another great interview episode. This has been Tom and Tracy. On the WTFFF 3D Printing Podcast. Thanks for listening to the WTFFF special series brought to you by the Z and 3D print teams from HP. You can access all the resources mentioned in this episode and all the other episodes in this series by going to 3dstartpoint.com slash HP. We invite you to reach out to us on social at 3D Start Point and at Z by HP and let us know what you are creating in 3D. 